Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So as I have mentioned, there is one to one similarity between transport of heat or temperature distribution and mass fraction distribution which is due to concentration gradient. Now, chemical similarity uh, therefore, uh, talks, which talks about the similarity of concentration profiles is similar to the distribution of temperature and uh, we can therefore, accordingly define. Uh, that chemically similar are those systems in which concentration difference, again the difference what comes exactly the same way we have defined in the context of uh, thermal similarity, in which concentration difference at corresponding locations and corresponding times bears a fixed ratio. So, if I say that concentration in terms of C minus uh, C i, say some C infinity value with reference uh, in the model to C over C infinity in the full scale and I would say this should come out to be some constant in the ratio, in which C may represent the concentration of any species. We can also write instead of concentration the mass fraction of that particular species. So, we can define in whichever units of concentration we may try to adopt. So, this is the definition of chemical similarity, concentration difference, ratio of concentration difference at corresponding points and corresponding locations are identical and exactly the same way this is going to be achieved when we have mass transport because of. So, we say mass or molar flux. So, n conduction or n diffusion model, n diffusion full scale is exactly is equal to n convection model by n convection full scale is exactly is equal to n convection n dot reaction model n dot reaction. So, this condition is to be satisfied and once if this condition is satisfied, the consequence of this is the similarity in concentration profile which is defined in accordance with the equation on the right. Now, we must understand that it is very difficult to satisfy this particular equation, particularly because of the involvement of this particular term which talks about the mass transport because of or species distribution because of chemical reaction, because we know that the rate of chemical reaction depends on temperature. So, therefore, if we are talking about you know, first geometrical similarity, then dynamic similarity, then we have th made th similar systems thermally similar. So, the temperature in the two systems are now different, but they are thermally similar, but that the absolute rate of the reaction depends on the temperature in accordance with the Arrhenius rate law. We all know that the rate of a chemical reaction is given in terms of a exponential q by r t activation and r t and this is the temperature dependence of rate and so therefore, if the temperatures are not identical in the model and the prototype systems in that case we are going to it will be very difficult to maintain a chemical similarity. So, you, you know you, we, we have a system in which we have geometrical similarity, mechanical similarity, then thermal similarity and we try to operate the system at a similar temperature, not same, but similar temperature and yet we would be able to satisfy this particular reaction, because we would not find species which will at that particular temperature react to give rise to a proportionate uh, reaction rates between the model and the prototype. So, it will be very difficult to achieve similarity in terms of mass generated because of or depleted because of chemical reactions by carrying out 
the model studies at a different temperature than the full scale itself. So, therefore, we will always carry out chemical similarity uh, studies or you know mass transport because of reactions etcetera in the system with regard to a small version, but the exact system itself. Suppose, if you are talking about sulfur concentration or oxygen concentration uh, in an oxygen spill making system, you know maybe we are there we are going to talk about that the system is small, but the temperature is exactly identical to the temperature in the full scale system, because at that particular temperature we are going to get a representative value of the reaction rates. So, we make this conclusion that look chemical reaction is going to be very difficult to satisfy in water models or in reduced scale models, where we are talking about you know various kinds of similarities, we will not find reactions which will give us representative rates at a corresponding uh, at the corresponding temperature. So, therefore, we are going to never study chemical similarity or rate of reactions through a different system rather than a representation of the actual system itself. So, therefore, again we must see that we are talking about the order is right, because we are we have said geometric similarity, then is dynamic similarity, then is thermal similarity, then is chemical similarity, because chemical similarity chemical or mass transport will depend on the absolute temperature as well as it will depend on convection which is the fluid flow part. So, therefore, only when we can talk about fluid flow, only when we talk about thermal similarity or the role of temperature in the system, then only we can possibly talk about the chemical similarity in the system, but we understand at the end that it is going to be extremely difficult for us to carry out any chemical similarity studies. Therefore, in reduced scale modeling studies, we will do fluid flow studies, mechanical similarity, we will do the even thermal similarities, even though there are some problems in thermal similarity also, but never ever we are going to carry out chemical similarity. Now, having said so much about the principles of physical modeling, let us now look at the issues of there are several issues we want to first see as a choice of scale factors. and operating liquid. This is an important I have already mentioned that scale factors will typically vary, it will be greater than 0 less than equal to 1. So, the modeler has an option to go for a scale factor of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 whatever is convenient and as I have mentioned that if you if you try to build up a full scale system. In that case, it is going to be prohibitively expensive, it will be difficult to operate also, you will require more space, more material etcetera. So, full scale modeling uh, in laboratory is perhaps not justified. Of course, many steel plants do have in their R and D uh, research and development laboratories, they have full scale models in the reactor, because there the space and resources are no constraint. But in laboratories, we would like to have a reduced scale model. Now, whether to go for a small scale model or a relatively bigger scale model. By small scale model, I am talking about lambda values of the order of 0 0.2, 0 0.3. I am a relatively bigger scale model, I am talking about scale factors is equal to 0 0.5. Now, in selecting the scale factor, one important thing we must remember that we need not disturb the uh, flow regimes or misrepresent the flow regimes. For example, we know that in ladles, for example, or in tan dishes, the flow are turbulent. Now, if you if you take a very small minuscule size of a tan dish and try to do the experiment, what happens is we because the scale is so small, in that case we may see that well the flow rate is also going to be small, and as a result of which velocity and uh, velocity as well as the length scale or the dimension of the system be so small that the Reynolds number in the system is going to be not very large. So, therefore, we can say that we have to choose such a scale factor that the characteristics of the steel making system is preserved well. Now, we must understand for example, we have if you, if you are talking about a ladle filling operation. For example, in the ladle filling operation, we have velocities of the order of 10 meters per second. On the other hand, if you talk about tan dish for example, we have velocities of the order of centimeters thumb rule is larger is the intensity of the system, 
you can go for a relatively smaller size systems because in smaller size system also because the pouring rate is very large the velocity is very large so therefore what we can see this arrow should be other ways this should be it goes like this yes so when the scale factor well, in systems where we have very large velocities or reasonably large velocities in that case what happened even if we go for a reduced scale small scale model we are going to see that the turbulence characteristics of the system is going to be preserved. On the other hand, when we are talking about velocities as such in the full scale system is very, very small okay, of the order of centimeters per second. In that case, we cannot afford to go to a very small size because in that case, the turbulence characteristics or other characteristics of the system are going to be totally lost. So, as a thumb rule, I would then conclude that if the system under consideration has got reasonable intensity of stirring okay, of the order of meters per second go to a scale factor, select a scale factor about 0 0.3, 0 0.3 to 0 0.3. On the other hand, if you are talking about uh, you know, systems where there are intensity of fluid motion as such is going to be very, very small. So, you can use. So, I would say B O F then little filling. These are the operations where we can go and maybe turn this gas starred ladles, these are the systems in which you should go maybe 0 0.4, 0 0.5, something like that. Operating liquid, now as I have mentioned to you that we have, we have decided that we are going in reduced scale models, uh, we are going to use most of the time water as the representative fluid because of certain conveniences which I have already uh, listed to you. So, having said that we are going to use water, we understand that we can only respect uh, Froude number and not Reynolds number uh, because of the similarities in the kinetic viscosity. Alternatively also, if we say, if we assume that in metallurgical systems, steel making systems per se, forget about water modeling or anything, if you, if you look at the steel making system and if you make this assertion that steel making systems are going to be dominated by the inertial and gravitational forces. The, actually, the bulk flow in the system is dominated by inertial and the gravitational forces. That means, steel making systems are essentially crowd dominated. Then, the definition of crowd number, as I have shown you, is characteristic velocity square by GL, and it does not talk about any dependence on the fluid properties. So, therefore, if the system, if the phenomena under consideration is governed by crowd number, in that case we can say in principle that look, we can use any liquid whatever comes to our mind, but mind that you know the condition which is present in the system need not be disturbed uh, by choosing you know any kind of fluid. For example, if I use a highly viscous plastic sort of a material to flow in a turn dish, in that case the flow regimes in the turn dish is going to be laminar, okay, because turbulence is going to be very difficult to generate in such systems. So, when I say that any kinds of fluid in principle is possible for fraud dominated system, this essentially implies that we are going to use any of those fluids which does not disturb the flow regimes in the steel making unit system. So, long as that condition is satisfied, in that case we have no problem, we can go for water, we can go for Wood's metal, we can go for mercury, we can do anything we want without and provided it does not disturb the fluid flow condition itself. So, we must understand that the operating liquid can be anything, and as I said, that we will like to use in most of the cases, in majority of the cases, water as a representative liquid because of our certain, because of certain advantages which I have already mentioned. And when I say water, in that case, it is understood that we are talking about only one similarity number characteristics which uh, would govern the process and in, invariably the choice would be in favor of the proud number itself. The second point that I would talk to, like to talk about is the limitations of water vapor. It is not that we can solve all problems or address all problems through water model. I have already mentioned to you that modeling, the word model as I will again explain in the context of mathematical modeling, 
it is it means certain certain approximations certain assumptions and as i have indicated to you that in building models physical models there are a lot of assumptions involved we are not even able to simulate this current geometry which uh, develops during the steel making process because of wearing out of the nozzles wearing out of the refractories because of the deposition of solid metal on the refractory wall uh, our inability to uh, you know simulate the nozzle geometries correctly so the physical model construction itself is with certain degree of assumptions and secondly i have also said that well if you are using water in that case we cannot respect both the numbers unless of course the scale is uh, the full scale model or full scale system so therefore in reduced scale models when you use water as such we have many approximations built in so therefore we must understand and also in the thermal similarity for example i have mentioned that well if you are using a glass vessel in that case although you can simulate the fluid flow part very well but thermal similarity you are not going to be able to match because the actual practical rate of heat extraction through the refractory wall is not going to, you cannot get it uh, through uh, the plexiglass model or through the glass model because you cannot use water for more than uh, 90 95 degree centigrade so therefore the wall heat fluxes outgoing heat fluxes uh, through water models cannot be replicated exactly and, and will not correspond to the actual industrial system so if i start listing there are many assumptions and idealizations based on which we are building the water models so therefore we can understand that water models may not always give us exact accurate and all possible uh, results which are relevant to us and there as i mentioned to you that the insight of a modeler and experience will come out to be very very handy so as you keep on doing modeling okay as you become more and more experienced you will be able to conclude based on your observations on an idealized situation that what would be the possible consequences in the shop floor when you when you have marginally different geometry or marginally different conditions and so on of greater relevance here is our inability in water model to simulate multi phase flow scenarios for example in most of the cases we have if you take a vessel for say maybe a ladle it is convenient to draw a ladle and that's why i have been always drawing a ladle and you have a plume and then on top of the plume you have say for example the slag layer so the slag it goes something like this typically in a gas tar ladle so the slag which serves as a protect protective cover uh, also uh, does many things uh, for example when you are talking of desulfurization suppose in your primary steel making you have been able to get desulfurization up to 0.01 0.01.012 percentage at the end of bs plus now you are talking about say this is your target final so you will have to now you have tapped the metal from the bof you have not been able to achieve the correct sulfur and you have to remove for the sulfur and the possibility of removing further sulfur is in secondary steel making or in ladle work now desulfurization as you all know is a slag metal reaction okay so you have sulfur sitting here in the metal and you would like to go let that sulfur go to the slag phase and that is essentially the desulfurization process so therefore in the ladle what you do in the ladle you blow argon at a typical high rate and as a result of which the slag layer now gets disturbed and you have droplets of slag forms there is a continuous entrainment of the slag layer particularly in the vicinity of the plume and this creation of large surface area aids in desulfurization reaction because 
if it is an interfacial reaction, heterogeneous chemical reactions are strongly dependent on the interfacial area, because it is on the interface that the heterogeneous chemical reaction takes place. Homogeneous reaction, as I have already mentioned, it takes place within the entire volume of the reactor, but heterogeneous reactions takes place only at the surface. So, therefore, more is the surface area, more is going to be the rate of reaction. So, when you have a planar slag metal interface, we have, you know, it is the nearly the area of the pi r square or uh, the area of the circle that you see from the top. But when you have infinite number of droplets or a very large number of droplets, in that case, that pi r square has now manifested into 100 times or 1000 times more area and as a result of which desulphurization is exacerbated. So, so, therefore, this sort of a feature, the entrainment of the droplet, uh, it is uh, the creation of the surface area, these are strongly dependent on the thermophysical properties of the slag. Now, the slag and the metal, for example, their density ratio is of the order of 7200 is to typical about. This is a typical value, this is the metal density, this is the slag density in kg per meter cube. These are typical values, this could be 24500 or 2600 depending, depending on the composition of the slag. Now, this density ratio is very difficult for us to achieve in the case of a laboratory spill water model, because in our case we have this is fixed at 1000 kg per meter cube, because this is water. So, therefore, we would like to have a liquid which is roughly about you know 400 kg per meter cube and so on. So, it is very difficult to match the density ratio, to match the viscosity of the slag, to match the interfacial tension of the slag into a aqueous model or a water model system. So, therefore, many of us have tried to investigate slag metal reaction kinetics by put using oil or organic solvents that, that is done in the laboratory. But we know that oil and organic solvents, for example, the oil has a density of about 980 kg per meter kg per meter cube, okay, and you see the density of water is about 1000 kg. So, this density ratio is absolutely much different from the density ratio of the actual slag and metal systems, and similar values can be said, similar things can be said about viscosity and interfacial tension as well. So, therefore, the actual slag metal system cannot be replicated through water models in a laboratory scale system, and this inability to represent the actual slag metal system uh, brings us to a point where we could we say that well multiphase interactions, the slag metal interactions, the slag metal reactions etcetera really cannot be replicated in laboratory by means of a water model. Now, this is, uh, but we can get some idea, some qualitative idea that well, if slag is there, then what kind of a behavior. For example, today it is well known that if you have a slag layer sitting on the top of uh, water bath or a slag layer which is sitting on the top of uh, a molten steel bath, in that case the slag, the presence of a slag for a given gas flow rate will cause the liquid to recirculate at a relatively slower rate. So, if there is no slag, in that case the liquid is going to recirculate faster. If there is a slag present, the liquid is going to recirculate at a slower rate, because the slag will eat up a part of the energy and this is a well known, but how much of energy is going to be eaten up in reality, that on a one to one mapping we will not be able to do, because of the mismatch of thermophysical properties. And this is proved very well, when people have studied that well, you have volumetric mass transport coefficient in an argon starred ladle, which is k w in a water model. What is this? This is mass transport coefficient, which is meters per second. This is area. So, this is meter cube per second and this is termed as the volumetric mass transport coefficient as a function of argon gas flow rate in a gas start ladle. And people have studied this by taking benzene and uh, water, benzene as the top liquid, water as the bulk liquid and studied the partitioning of benzoic acid in the in between the two. to calculate the mass transport volumetric mass transport coefficient and it was found that well it goes like something like this 
and then it goes like this. This is about the slope is 0 0.07, the slope is about 2.5, the slope is about 1.4, this is the least slope, this is the maximum slope, this is still uh, the intermediate slope, okay, as I have drawn. But if the same experiment is carried out in a, say, I will draw it in an inset, it looks like at 12, the slope goes something like this. Okay. So, therefore, while the slope gradually increases, so the least slope is here, then the intermediate slope is still bigger and then finally, in the third region, these are the three characteristics argon flow rate. Okay. This is the argon flow rate 1, this is the so Q 1 and this is Q 2. So, we do see three distinct regions as we see in the water model. So, the bigger plot is for water model. And the smaller plot is for actual steel making system, steel making little. So, the similarity that I see here in this system, what is used? In this system, we have used benzene as the top liquid, benzene is lighter than water, water is the bulk liquid and we have studied a partitioning of benzoic acid between slag and water, which is to study the partitioning of sulphur between slag and metal. And this is the actual gas start system, where you have the slag, a basic slag, melt or the bulk liquid is steel and we have studied the partitioning of sulphur as a function of argon flow rate. So, what we see that yes, there are indeed two characteristic gas flow rates, this is also exhibited, but there is some gross difference between the behavior, because here what we see that the slope gradually increases and the final region at the largest flow rate show gives us the highest exponent, okay. but here the slope increases abruptly in the second region and then it slows down. So, it is slower on the left hand side, it is slower on the right hand side, but intermediate gas flow rates have the most steepest dependence of volumetric mass transfer coefficient on Q. So, there is a dis some dissimilarity between the, these two graphs 1 and 2, even though the characteristic flow rates seem to be depicted uh, to some extent, uh, replicated to some extent in the water model itself. So, you see this is one flow rate, but the slope changes. This is again the second characteristic flow rate, where the slope changes. Again, what you see here, that this is the first flow rate, where the slope changes. This is the second time the slope changes. So, these behaviors are actually identical, even though the exact slopes may not be identical. And this precisely tells us, or this is a confirmation of the fact that we really uh, cannot replicate or exactly cannot replicate the multiphase characteristics of water model systems uh, with a uh, multiphase characteristics of a steel making system with water model itself. Let us now talk about the third point, which is very important for us, is measurements and measure, measuring devices. Measurement. I have said that models and measurements are like friends. Okay. So, without companion measurements, no model study is accurate or no model study can give us any meaningful information, because we do not know even that whether the models are correct or not. The models are going to generate some number and we have to physically verify that number with the aid of measurements. So, modeling and measurements are true companion of a accurate or realistic uh, investigation. Now, when you talk of measurements and measuring devices, we can talk this in terms of there will be one set of observations or equipments and techniques which are going to be used in water models and we are going to be used in high temperature system. What do we measure? For example, in steel making systems. We measure phases, whether it is a slag or it is metal. We can measure temperature, we can measure mass flow rate, we can measure uh, activities or concentrations, uh, we can measure weight uh, through a load cell. So, there are a lot of measurements which are carried out routinely in a steel plants. We must understand that measurement in steel plant 
is on a sustained basis is very very difficult because the probes capable of performing at high temperature, sustainable probes capable of performing at high temperature are not readily expensive and this is way are not readily available and these are in uh, some sense very expensive uh, as well. So, I will first talk a little bit about uh, measurements in water models and then we will uh, identify the corresponding equipments and techniques uh, in the actual steel making systems. Now, in physical model studies, measurements we can we, we can do various types of measurements. The most important kinds of measurements is the observation of the flow pattern or flow visualization. Okay, so flow visualization, flow measurements, then measurements of mass transport coefficient, measurement of melting rates, and as I said that we will not like to do measurements on the full scale on the on the model system and scale it up. We may we may wish to carry out some measurements and some studies in the system without scaling up the result. We just want to get some insight of the phenomena. Okay. For example, I can put in a solid inside and study the dissolution of solid as a function of the gas flow rate and try to understand that if I increase the gas flow rate, then whether the dissolution of the solid. Okay. This is a solid which is immersed into the liquid. If I increase the gas flow rate and whether the dissolution increases or not, I can study this behavior of dissolution on a fundamental scale without bothering that I would like to scale it up to the actual system itself. So, many a times we do measurements, we carry out investigations, we do some representative studies in the physical models in order to gain useful insight of the process without considering that we are going to directly extrapolate the result to the full scale system itself. So, we can various types of measurements are actually carried out and I am going to briefly talk about first the flow visualization. Now, flow visualization because we are using water, we are using a plexiglass model. So, therefore, this is of great advantage to us that we can physically see that what is the flow pattern. We can understand that which are the regions where the flows are very strong, which are the regions where flow is weak, how the flow is circulating or recirculating in the system, which are the regions where dead volumes are present. So, all these features can be carried out by studying or visualizing the flow itself. How do we visualize flow? We can add some tracer elements into the water. What could be that tracer element? That tracer element may be a coloring agent, for example, potassium permanganate. If you drop one spoon of potassium permanganate into water from the top, you will be able to see how the potassium permanganate disperses in the system, giving you an idea the overall flow pattern in the system itself. In some localities, you can inject uh, potassium permanganate and then see that how does the velocity. For example, I can take a syringe and through a syringe, I can inject in this particular region to find out that whether the flow near the wall is vertically downward or the flow near the wall is vertically upward. So, visualization of the flow and flow pattern is going is, is very conveniently done by tracer injection. Also, uh, we can uh, take neutrally bound particles. For example, uh, we have uh, glass spheres, very tiny glass spheres, which are of the micron size and if we add those particles inside, in that case the particles follow the streamlines of the fluid and then give you uh, the recirculating pattern. So, therefore, if you can illuminate the system properly, you can take a camera and capture the movement of those glass particles, tiny glass particles, micron size glass particles in the system and then look it on the computer screen or on the TV screen and find out that what is the overall flow pattern in the system. How do you measure the flow? Okay, this is the qualitative part, flow visualization is the qualitative part. Now, we are talking about flow measurements, we have various types of measuring equipments as far as water modeling is concerned. We must understand that there is no way you can see the flow pattern in the steel system, okay, because steel, steel is opaque. So, you really do not know how the flow is going on and that we have been able to create a representative physical model. So, since we have respected geometric similarity and dynamic similarity, that mechanical uh, dynamic and kinematic similarity conditions are fulfilled between the model and the full scale. So, therefore, we can understand that the flow pattern that we are going to see in the model system is going to be exactly the same flow pattern in the full scale system. But I mentioned or repeat again that there is no way that we can find out what is the flow pattern in the system. Similarly, there is a very little scope of measuring the velocity uh, in the full scale system also. We can maybe with great difficulty measure at one location, but if I am talking of a huge vessel which is 3 meter by 3 meter and then at every point 
measuring the velocity is going to be very, very difficult. On the other hand, I can say that it is, there are many equipments which we can use to map the velocity field uh, in a water model system. And most important today are called the PIV particle image velocimetry. Of course, we have laser Doppler velocimetry also, LDV. We have hot film anemometer also, HFA. And these are the common. This is an old technique. So, that is the way the development took place. So, presently, very few people would be using hot film anemometer, particularly for our kind of a system, because these are, these are all point by point measuring technique, which essentially tells us that we will measure point by point. On the other hand, PIV, we can have a two dimensional PIV or a three dimensional PIV, and with the two and three dimensional PIV, we can map a plane in one shot or we can map the three dimensional uh, flow pattern in the system in one go. So, this is a very quick method of mapping the entire flow field uh, in the system uh, very quickly. For laser Doppler velocimeter, for example, you have to take it from one point to another point to make the measurement. So, you have to move the equipment up and down or in this particular direction in order to find out and you, the, uh, the velocities of the location and you can imagine how many such planes are going to be there. So, it is going to be an extremely tedious task to map even the velocity field prevalent in a water model. On the other hand, with PIV, you can do it possibly in one tenth or one hundredth of a time. So, there are many equipments which are available. I repeat again, particle image velocimetry, laser Doppler velocimetry, hot film manimometer, these are the standard techniques. You can, if you are interested about this measure flow measuring techniques, you can look at the internet or in some textbook and know about this. Apart from this, we have other techniques also, which I am going to now uh, describe. These are melting techniques, uh, then mass transport, phase dispersion and so on. Okay. So, before I proceed to discuss uh, the melting methods, weight loss method. conductivity measurements pH measurements etc let me talk about uh, so before I'll discuss this but I want to uh, talk about one probe which uh, is called as a drag probe that is used to measure the flow field uh, or velocity at a location. I would not say flow field, it is the velocity at any particular location in a steel mill. So, drag probe essentially implies that you take advantage of this is C d into half rho v square into area, that is the drag force. And the drag force is related to the coefficient of drag, velocity and area which is perpendicular to the direction of the flow. Now, there are standard drag probes which are immersed into molten steel bath. So, if you have a drag probe which is connected to a strain gauge, and assuming that you know the drag coefficient, because the probe has a fixed area you can, if you can somehow measure the force. So, the measured force can be converted to the corresponding velocity uh, very conveniently. So, drag probe has been developed uh, for steel bath and the force is exerted by the flowing fluid on this probe, which is measured by strain gauge is directly converted into the velocity and this has come out handy in many laboratory scale uh, measurements, but I really do not know of any situation where such a probe has been measured in an industrial system on a sustained basis to know the flow of, or the intensity flow in the system itself. Now, melting methods are basically used to understand uh, the melting behavior of solids in steel. For example, in a water model, you can take an ice and study the melting of ice as a function of flow rate, as a function of vessel geometry, as a function of location in the system and so on. And thereby understand 
that well what are the conditions that expedites melting, what are the conditions uh, that uh, retards melting. Similarly, weight loss method is also carried out to understand the rate of dissolution for example. So, you can you can immerse for example, uh, a benzoic acid compact in a water bath and let that compact get dissolved because benzoic acid will dissolve in water. So, as a result of the dissolution of the benzoic acid, what happens is its weight will continuously go down. So, suppose I immerse the benzoic acid and then it is connected to a load cell. So, it is recording continuously uh, the weight of the uh, benzoic acid compact immersed in the water bath and as time goes on, what happens is that the weight decreases. So, I would say weight versus time. And then you see that the weight, I am just drawing it for the sake of convenience maybe decreasing linearly, because as a result of dissolution of benzoic acid in the bath, so I have the benzoic acid compact here okay, and this is, so benzoic acid compact, so it is dissolving as a result of which its weight is continuously decreasing and that behavior is replicated in this particular. This, if the compact is of cylindrical shape, I can convert this weight in terms of a corresponding radius, because I know the density. So, the volume is correlated with the length as well as the radius and that I know already the density of benzoic acid. So, therefore, the weight can be converted in terms of a radius. So, I can also draw as well radius varies something like this. Now, once I know r versus t, then I can calculate that for example, d r over d t, the rate of change of the radius and this rate of the change of the radius is actually proportional to the mass transport coefficient, which one can very conveniently show. So, therefore, by carrying out this weightless, weight loss method okay, with suitable species or uh, solid compacts we should be able to determine that what is the mass transport coefficient and find out that well, how does the weight changes as a function of time, if the argon flow rate changes, if the liquid becomes more taller or the deeper or the diameter of the vessel becomes more wider or this point actually moves down to this particular location. In that case, we can study all the effect of operating conditions on the weight, which can be converted to corresponding radius and based on which the mass transport coefficient can be calculated and we can say that well based on the weight loss method, uh, we can study that well whether the dissolution of the solid is going to be expedited under certain condition, under which condition and retarded under which condition that we will be able to find out based on weight loss method. Conductivity measurements basically and pH measurements both of them are basically used to map concentrations. You remember I talked about the residence time distribution in the tan dish. So, I, I in the water model, if I have a tan dish like this, the fluid is coming here. Now, I have injected a tracer here and I want to monitor the concentration here. That is what is the residence time distribution studies talks about, that you inject a tracer and monitor the concentration here. The bath is water, I have to inject it tracer here and monitor the concentration, how do I do it? So, suppose if I use sodium chloride as my sodium chloride solution as my tracer, the so, sodium chloride is a ionic solid. So, lot of you know we will have higher conductivity as sodium chloride gets into this solution. So, if I have here a conductivity probe, that conductivity probe can give us direct information about the concentration of sodium chloride at the exit itself and it will help us. This conductivity probe will give us conductivity which can be converted to the concentration of sodium chloride because conductivity and concentration in most of the cases we see are directly uh, proportional. Also, it is possible to inject an acid for example here. Instead of a sodium chloride solution, we can inject acid if permissible, if it does not affect the walls of the vest plexiglass vessel and then we can may not use a conductivity probe, but we can use pH measurement probe, okay, pH measuring devices 
and that can be there and with this we should be able to find out that how much of acid is coming here and as a result of that we should be able to find out that from the pH that what is the concentration of hydrogen and what is the concentration of acid. So, therefore, distribution of pressure or concentration profiles in the system can be obtained by from this. We also have a technique like electrical conductivity technique which is used uh, conductivity probes basically which are used in two phase flows. in gas turbulent system. For example, you inject bubble here. So, if you use a two needle conductivity probe, okay, this two needle conductivity probe will give rise to some signal in terms of conductivity based on which we can distinguish between bubble and liquid. So, as I mentioned to you that within the plume region, what you have? You have bubbles which are dispersed. 2 to 5 percent of the volume of the plume is going to be occupied by bubble. So, therefore, at some point of time, the probe is like this the bubble will come hit the probe and then the bubble goes away and next behind the bubble comes water and water strikes. So, intermittently you have sometimes water striking, sometimes bubble striking, sometimes water striking, sometimes bubble striking and this is going to create a different kind of a signal and based on that you will be able to find out that what is the bubble rise velocity. So, discrimination of the two phase characteristics of the gas liquid plumes in water model can be very conveniently done with conductivity. If you come to full scale system or steel processing system, in that case we find that this sort of a probes are very difficult. Of course, some probes have been generated for laboratory scale studies, but in industry as I have mentioned to you that we mostly measure temperature. We measure flow rates, we measure activity. We measure weight, we measure pressure, many things, phases for example. So, flow rates for example, flow rates of argon which is coming or flow rates of oxygen which is getting into the oxygen still making convert are no problem, because this is outside the bath, the, the flow meter is not going to be exposed to the environment still making environment, it is going to be uh, away from the reactor. So, therefore, measuring flow rates is absolutely no problem. It is going to be similar to what we have done in the case of uh, water models. For example, you can use rotometers or orifice meters in order to calculate or know the flow. Activity for example, if you want to find out that what is the activity of iron oxide in the slag, in that case you have to collect the slag sample. So, there direct intervention with the melt comes into play and therefore, you can use for example, some kind of a probe, flux probe for example, which you can immerse it, it can give you the temperature and it can give you the activity of oxygen simultaneously based on which you can calculate uh, the uh, iron oxide content of the slag itself. But note that since now your probe is going to be intervening with the high temperature system, you may use it only for once and then for the second time if you wish to measure it, you have to use a separate probe itself. So, the issue of uh, repeated usage uh, becomes a very big problem. Weight, what typically we do? Weight we measure by uh, you know putting material in the load cell. So, we have load cells which are uh, available to us on the base of the tan dish, the load cell can be there and that can monitor continuously the rate of change of weight in the system. We have pressure transducers or accelerometers are also there. We can find out uh, the vibrations for example. We can accelerometers, accelerometers. We have laser devices are also there, as I have mentioned to you, that we have a laser gun that senses the height of the uh, melt surfaces. So that measures the what the measures? It measures the height or distance. H e i g h t. Height or distance. You have laser devices. So, there are devices which are non intervening with the liquid metal system. So, for those we have no problem, they will last for long, but those which will directly intervene with the molten steel, for example, temperature. Okay? If you want to measure the temperature, the probe has to go inside the melt itself and in that case 
you may have a problem because the probe may not function properly at that particular temperature. It may give erroneous results, it may become faulty, it may develop cracks and other things. Lot of problem can take place really at high temperature system. So, using of probes uh, to measure uh, temperature, uh, activity, etcetera on a sustained basis. Uh, of course, temperature can be measured through non-contacting devices also like op optical or radiation pyrometers, but if you use an immersion yeah, immersion thermocouple type of a device, in that case you have problem because we are in interacting with the metal itself. So, I would I would not like to say anything beyond that. Uh, now, I would like to talk about uh, the next important part of modeling which is uh, the mathematical modeling. But before we proceed, I would like to very briefly uh, summarize uh, whatever we have done in the physical modeling section. So, uh, I told you that there are some principles which you have to respect or some similarity criterion criteria which you have to respect in order to make physical model and in this I have explained to you that geometrical, uh, mechanical, thermal and chemical similarities are important issues. Now, geometrical and mechanical similarities are will always be satisfied, there is no problem about it, but in reduced scale models I have told that it is really going to be difficult particularly when you use water as the representative fluid to satisfy all the numbers. Uh, so, therefore, uh, fortunately since the material, since the metallurgical or steel making processes are uh, uh, processes appear to be crowd dominated. So, we can say that well, we, we, we can use water without any problem and water also has the same type of a kinematic viscosity. So, we do not disturb the flow patterns, you know, if you, if you scale it up, if the flow pattern in the system, full scale system is turbulent, since water has the same sort of a kinematic viscosity at the corresponding uh, scale also on the reduced scale, uh, the features, flow features are going to be also similar to the full scale system itself. Now, thermal similarities are going to be a little bit difficult to maintain and chemical similarities perhaps are going to be impossible uh, to respect. And all these similarity criteria, uh, I have told you that they can be derived starting from the governing equation if they are known or they can also be derived from uh, knowing the fundamentals of the process itself. If the governing equation is not applicable, in that case you can find out by carrying out a dimensional analysis, which of course, you have not talked here, but you may have been exposed already to dimensional analysis. Uh, so, through, through dimensional analysis, we should be able to generate crowd number, Reynolds number, Fourier number, etcetera, or these numbers can be generated from the governing equation. So, all the similarity criteria are going to be, uh, can be generated by considering the governing equation. I have tried to emphasize repeatedly that physical model cannot be used for everything and model word itself implies that this is there is some sense of an inaccuracy is involved or idealization involved and I have mentioned that throughout. So, we must understand the potential and limitation of water models particularly and I said the biggest advantage of using water model is our ability to measure the flow uh, as well as uh, see the flow pattern itself. This is the single most advantage of uh, water modeling which is unparalleled. And because we have been able to match dynamic and um, uh, dynamic kinematic and geometrical similarity realistically well, so you can get a nice representative scenario of the actual steel making uh, system as far as flow is concerned. Multiphase flow, we are not sure, we cannot quantitatively analyze, but we can get some qualitative information, qualitative information uh, of the slag metal interactions and behavior in actual system. And I have also categorically mentioned and shown you that you know to what extent one can get uh, uh, representative observations or some of the meaningful observations which may not be accurately uh, representative of the uh, full scale uh, system. And finally, I have also uh, talked about uh, the choice of a fluid, the scale factor. In scale factor, I have emphasized that when you have intensity of the flow very appreciable, you can go for a relatively smaller scale factor and when you have intensity of flow uh, very weak, you can go for a little bit higher scale factor, so that you do not disturb the flow pattern itself. And finally, I have give, tried to given you uh, some idea about the measurements and trying to emphasize that if you do modeling at any stage, please go for companion measurements, because without measurements our models are incomplete, we do not see really anything. And there is enough scope of carrying out measurements in full scale as well as experimental systems and in ex full scale systems I have mentioned that our steel processing system that because the high temperature uh, where we are going to have measurements, but the measuring device is going to directly intervene with the fluid, 
okay, so which we call as an evasive and non-evasive techniques. So non-evasive techniques have no problem because because they are not going to be exposed to the high hazardous uh, high temperature condition. But evasive techniques like immersion thermocouples, immersion oxygen probe, they are going to be uh, problematic to some extent. Particularly when you have a huge reactor size, laboratory scale is no problem. You have this much reactor, you can put in a slug probe very easily. But imagine if you have a 300 ton ladle or a 300 ton oxygen steel making furnace, you know, putting an oxygen probe, you have to have you know great automated devices and so on. So it is it is little bit tricky. But on the other hand, as far as uh, physical modeling is concerned, we can carry out innumerable type of uh, measurements. Now coming to mathematical modeling, uh, in physical model we have represented the process in terms of an actual physical replica. Okay, that replica was having is having different scale. It is having different materials. Now we wish to represent a given phenomena. Okay, the system and a given phenomena in terms of a mathematical model. So therefore, if a question comes, I want to represent LD converter in terms of a mathematical model. So I would say that what in an LD converter you would like to represent in terms of a mathematical model. So the phenomena under question will be represented, or the process under question is going to be represented in terms of a mathematical model, which is either a differential equation or an algebraic equation. Now, the word model, I come back to this critical point which I have been mentioning, the word model implies that there are certain inherent approximations and assumptions involved. Now, mathematical expressions for example, there are mathematical expressions, for example, Ohm's law, you write down current voltage, uh, uh, current voltage resistance relationship or you have Fourier's law of heat conduction. Okay? So, these equations are also mathematical expressions, but we call them law. On the other hand, the mathematical expressions that we are going to write for steel making system, we are going to call them as models because we are going to build those mathematical equations with certain assumptions and approximations. Laws are what? That corresponds exactly with the reality. Okay? Whatever I observe and whatever the law says, there is one to one correspondence. On the other hand, whatever I see and whatever the model predicts, there may not be any one to one correspondence. The model will have certain differences from the observation. If the models repeatedly produces results which are exactly, you know, regardless of geogra geographical boundaries or any locations or any constraint, because Ohm's law is valid here also in other continents as well. Same is Fourier's law of heat conduction. So, if my model, if the model of a, if my model of a particular steel making process is found to produce exactly the same result, okay, in different steel plants all over the globe, then you can say possibly that this model is now as good as a law because there is no approximations involved, there is no idealization involved, and hence the model predicts whatever we are observing in reality. There is one to one correspondence, and hence, so yesterday's model may become tomorrow's law. You know. So, what do the models do in steel making? What is the purpose? There are various jobs the models do. The models can carry out through models process analysis and design. This is one job of analysis and design. We can do process optimization. We can do process control. And we can artificial so I will write this, I will draw this figure and show you that this is my mathematical model. So, this is process optimization, this is process control, this is 
artificial input and this is process analysis. Process control. So, mathematical model, this I have explained in the context, for example, of flow rate control in an in a, in a turn dish and I said that well, how was the aperture nozzle of the turn dish adjusted? It was based on a control algorithm which is a mathematical model which may be the boundaries equation. So, that equation correlates with the opening of the aperture and the flow rate and adjust uh, or you know controls the movement of the motion. So, therefore, process control models are going to be models, mathematical models which are going to use for control and these models are going to be very, very simplistic because you have to perform the model or the model has to perform in very small amount of time or in a realistic time frame. During rolling, the roll gap has to be changed dynamically. What controls it? There are control algorithms, there are control mathematical models can do. Process optimization. So, this is process control is done in an online fashion. It is interacting on a one to one basis in real time frame. Process optimization, process analysis and design are done in an offline fashion. So, I can optimize the process sitting in my laboratory and tell that well, you change the flow rates, you change this, you change that and then you get an optimum condition itself. Similarly, process analysis and design, this all can also be done in the case of uh, in an offline fashion and I can say that well, you know, well, at what should be the ideal L by D ratio for your plant, what should be the capacity of the ladle for your plant, all these sorts of a design calculations I should be able to do based on solving some mathematical equations, uh, solving some mathematical equations sitting in the laboratory also and my mathematical model can also interface with artificial intelligence and provide information. So, this mathematical model that I have here as I mentioned that it is either an algebraic equation or a differential equation. Representing a given phenomenon. So, unless and until I say that what is that phenomena, we cannot develop the model, okay. We cannot uh, formulate the algebraic equation or the differential equation. So, merely saying I want to have a mathematical model of an LD converter is an ambiguous statement. You have to specifically mention that what is the process of the phenomena and then try to represent the process and then see whether you want process control to be done, process optimization, process analysis design and so on, okay.